Revolution. I can't get no call to action, but I try and I try and I try. Hello and, and welcome to Call to Action, the go to podcast for anyone trying to make sense of the world of marketing, advertising, and beyond. In an industry that is a minefield of utter bollocks, we aim to capture our heroes and allies from the front line to have a chinwag with. It's like Pokemon Go, with the single but vital exception that it's not a short-term bandwagon of shite. It's brought to you by Gasp, and I'm Giles Edwards. Today, I've caught Lee Grinnell, a top marketing director and fellow Ritson student. Lee's smarts span all elements of proper marketing diagnosis, strategy, and tactics. Obsessed with applying the latest thinking from marketing leaders like Burnett, Field, and Sharp to professional services, he's cut his teeth in-house and in consultancies across both B2B and B2C. If I hadn't had the pleasure of working alongside Lee for several months now, I might have been surprised by how smart and charming he is, but I have, so I'm not. Then I remember he's an Arsenal fan. So let's just stop there. Lee says, building your budgets based on the average of what everyone else does will just drive you towards being the average of everyone else. And why would you want that? Welcome to the show, Lee. Thank you, Giles. Good to be here. (laughs) Good stuff. Right, seven quick fires. Mac or PC? Uh, Mac. Straight to Christopher Nolan now. Inception or Interstellar? Yeah, Inception. (laughs) Efficiency or effectiveness? Effectiveness. Oh, you're finding these too easy. Be different or be distinct? Oh, God. Uh, I'm going to say be different because Mark Ritson might hit me otherwise. (laughs) (laughs) Thierry Henry or Dennis Bergkamp? Oh, Dennis. Yes. Yes. Yes, We can agree on that. Right, two more. Hyacinth Bouquet or Lee Grunnell? (laughs) (laughs) I do know I'm going slightly off tangent now many years ago a law firm I worked with uh, the chap I shared an office with we we realized that you you had your security pass with your name on but you could get anything you wanted printed where your name is it didn't have to be your actual name so I did get um, them to print one with an acute accent over the e of Grinnell to um, try and give myself that slightly sort of continental sheen so uh, yes, it's uh, yeah. I'll, I'll go with I'll go with Lee Grunnell. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't exist. Brilliant. And and lastly, being ambushed by a cake or accidentally eating an entire stack of hash poppadoms. <laughs> <laughs> H- having having experienced the the hash poppadoms, I'm I'm going to go for the cake because I think that might be slightly less scary actually. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Amazing. Oh, Lee, I'm so pleased you're here. So to start the show, Call to Action likes to celebrate the weird and wonderful ways that guests uh, find themselves where they do. So you have a degree in history, a love of marketing uh, and a career mainly in professional services. But what was your first ever job and what was your first proper marketing job? So uh, so my parents and well, and obviously, and me as well, not just my parents. Uh, we moved to Boston in Lincolnshire when I was, I think, about 12. So like most sort of teenagers growing up in Lincolnshire, my my very first ever job was picking Brussels sprouts in summer holidays. So a chap I was at school with, his dad was a ganger, which effectively, as far as I can tell, is just someone that exploits kids to go and pick vegetables in fields so yeah so my first job was spending a summer picking brussels sprouts which is still is without doubt the most backbreaking work i've ever done in my life utterly uh utterly devastating how does that work do you have do you have do you just have time where you just have to constantly be doing that do you have targets you have so many brussels sprouts is it on weight or just childhood child slave labor it's pretty much it's yeah child slave labor it's okay here's a field and you've got a day to pick all of those Brussels sprouts. And yeah, so I remember, yeah, so it was pretty much sort of, you know, 7.30 you start and just spend the day walking up and down in rows, picking Brussels sprouts. 
And yeah, it's a, it's a weird place, actually, Boston, because it's Lincolnshire is so, I think, still the largest county in terms of agriculture as its, as its dominant industry. You kind of had in Boston during the, during the summer months, everybody was employed because they were either working in the fields or in the factories linked to fruit and vegetables. And then in the winter, nobody was employed. So you, as, again, as far as I could tell, everybody just drank um, it's kind of what I imagine Reykjavik to be like in some ways during the, the dark winter of nothing to do but uh, but drink and fight. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that was my very first ever job. Um, my first proper job was writing pitches for an IT recruitment firm. So, like I said, I studied history at university and had no idea what I wanted to do job-wise aside from the fact that I wanted to go to London, because that kind of just seemed like, well, that's kind of what you do. You, you go to university and then, you know, you need a job. So you go to London where all the jobs are. And yeah, managed to work, managed to get a job. It was called Abraxas, um, which I'm, I'm pretty sure in saying the guy who that founded it um, was a huge Santana fan. And Abraxas was the name of a Santana album, which, you know, how we came up with the name. Um, yeah. And then spent... You know, I think it was there for about two and a half years writing, writing pitches, which kind of bizarrely, I, I remember sort of people all used to say, you know, how have you ended up going from studying history to writing pitches from an IT recruitment firm? And I think the that sort of approach to essay writing and, you know, crafting an argument and condensing lots of facts and information into, you know, a, 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 a short, coherent piece actually it was quite good grounding in a way for writing pitches because it kind of was, okay, we've got these questions we need to answer and we've got all of this information about the business. How do we you know, filter that and refine it to something really concise and persuasive? So yeah, it was sort of a, a bizarrely easy but completely tangential move, I think. And from then to EY and a life of professional services marketing. And, and at any stage during your history degree, had you intended to go in that direction? No, not at all. So I, it's, it's, it's funny, actually, my, so my daughter at the moment is, she's going to be doing her GCSEs um, later this year and then thinking about, you know, where to study A-levels. And I remember going through school and at some point, you know, your teachers say to you, oh, you need to pick what subject you want to study for your GCSEs. I remember thinking, I've never heard of GCSEs. I don't know what you're talking about, but fair enough. Okay, I'll do these subjects. And then a couple of years later, you need to pick what you want to study for A-levels. And having no idea what they were or why. But I picked history because I, just because I liked it and had, again, it sounds like a rather sort of trad history boys-esque way, um, a really kind of energetic and inspirational A-level history teacher who was himself just out of university. So he'd done his teacher training, so he'd been, what, 22, 23, um, and just really, really loved it. Um, and sort of talking to him, and he he kind of had the, had these sort of the, the infamous words, you know, you can do anything with a history degree, which at the end of my history degree turned out to, what is this everything? Because I can't see anything overt or kind of clearly linked other than becoming a going into academia so yeah I had had no idea what I wanted to do with it and I imagine like lots of people frankly you go to university and you study something you enjoy and at the end of it try and work out what you want to do with the rest of your life I think it's something that I do consistently hear when I talk to people especially on on this podcast and I find that really encouraging however I still wonder if it's known to those who are like your daughter going through the anxieties and stress of, of, of maybe assuming they need to know which direction they're going in already when it comes to choosing GCSEs and universities, etc. Yeah, it is, it is that bizarre thing, isn't it, of at, you know, 18, you know, sending people off to university and you, you, it's only when you're 42 as I am now that you realise how ridiculously young that is. Um, and I do, I do wonder if this is maybe, you know, that hangover from a time when life expectancy was 
60 or whatever it was that yeah by the time you're you know eight you know 18 or, or 16 or 15 or whatever you were expected to go into the world of work because you only had you know not that long left before you'd be retiring and 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 then dying whereas you know as life expectancy is going up you do wonder actually yeah maybe that needs to shift that sort of educational timeline because it's just it's bonkers isn't it you know start making decisions at, at 16 and 18 and 21 just utterly nonsensical yeah and both drayton bird and and steve harrison his mentee in fact at ogilvy have both made the point on recent episodes that actually having experience of life outside of the industry makes them better and more effective at what they do and i refuse to believe that that's just exclusively true of our industry that's just being well-rounded and experienced in in you know the life is uh, is is a skill in itself. So actually, I think we need to kind of somehow reduce that anxiety that that people face at that age. And so so then at EY Ernst and Young, did that then evolve into a marketing role because that wasn't actually specifically marketing? Am I right? No, it wasn't. So I kind of almost sort of I would break down my I was going to say break down my career. That sounds incredibly self-aggrandizing, doesn't it? But <laughs> my 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 time at work into sort of different chunks i think and probably until 2012 the vast majority of my experience was more on the the business development side of things and the marketing side of things so i joined so i joined ey not that long after anderson's had collapsed and the, the enron scandal and everything and it was at this sort of juncture that all of the accounting firms suddenly realized oh shit, we're not going to get all of that work passed to other parts of the business from doing the audit because that's now been the audit and the advisory work been separated out. So our tax practice, you know, in the context of the role I was doing, we've got to go out and win work for ourselves. So I, yeah, spent, you know, again, two and a half, three years working on sort of account planning, client relationship management, sort of go-to-market stuff, um, with the for the global tax practice at EY, so my my boss was the global tax sales director, and yeah, I joined at the point that he was tasked with effectively designing the key client program, which was was brilliant. I remember suddenly, you know, and it is fascinating, kind of just thinking about the world then and, and how different it is now. But at the time, you know, they just didn't think twice about flying a load of tax partners from around the world to, you know, Frankfurt to do some, and two days thinking about the Deutsche Bahn account and and what we were going to do and how you were going to grow it and who the people were. And which was a kind of a massively eye-opening for me, because I think at that point, so this was, yeah, 2006, I think I'd only been on a plane about twice in my entire life. And the first time being told, okay, we're going to wherever, Paris or Zurich or wherever it was, and having to go to Heathrow Airport and never having been to Heathrow Airport and finding it the most exciting thing in the whole world. And suddenly realizing the glamour of international business travel was anything but glamorous, but still exciting for, yeah, a 20, whatever I was then, 25-year-old. 26 year old kid so so yeah it was it was it was great fun actually I think interesting my 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 one sort of genuine regret I think sort of business-wise happened at EY um, where I was offered the chance to go and move to Madrid and work in the in the the, the Madrid office of EY and turning it down for some reason I can't think why I did that now but um yeah that would have been quite good fun I think living in Madrid for a while a great city. I haven't been there many times. In fact, the only time I have, or the last time I was there, was when McManaman played for Real Madrid. And I remember getting into the Bernabeu for about four euros. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I've, no, I've, I've, I've still never been to Madrid, actually. I've been to, obviously done Barcelona. But yeah, still to go to Madrid, so I'll have to add that to my list. So yeah, no, EY was was pretty much purely on the on the BD side of things rather than rather than the marketing marketing side. When did that focus kind of evolve? I mean, I know, I know certainly in your industry, and and and, and um, it's true. I think of a lot of profes- professional services that BD and marketing kind of sit 
next to each other, if not overlap quite more, more significantly than perhaps they do in other sectors. So, but, but when did that kind of ratio change slightly? So I would say, so I, from EY, I joined what was then Beechcroft, now DAC Beechcroft. It was probably towards the end of my time at, at, at DAC Beechcroft, actually, where I think I sort of started to move, sort of move across a little bit. So again, at, at DAC Beechcroft, the the focus, and again, it's interesting actually with kind of, you know, the whole how brands grow and reaching all buyers, Ben Edenfield stuff, kind of looking back at, you know, the, the, the relentless focus we had at DAC Beechcroft on key account management, which in, in, in some ways, uh, you know, was, was, was right, you know, you've got accounts there where you're you know, regularly billing, you know, 10, 15, 20 million pounds a year, you do need to, to, to protect that. But we, as it's interesting looking, you know, we were regularly growing sort of within our sort of key client portfolio, growing those client revenues about 20% year on year. But the overall growth for the firm was much, 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 much slower, sort of two, 3% growth, um, which I do kind of look back and almost think if I could go back in time and and, and alter the approach there slightly. That I think that would could have done something really interesting. So I think it was probably sort of at that point where I kind of realised there's kind of not much more to do on on BD and key client management now because that's all just happening and, and, and well embedded. And what what's the rest of it? And you know, I I think I was always relatively sort of willing to look outside of kind of my own industry at what else was going on and, you know, starting to read, you know, marketing week and sort of pick up on, on, on wider things and sort of wider industry issues. I think it was at that point that I suddenly began realizing, okay, there's, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. I think I was probably in a a fortunate position of that. I, I knew what I didn't know rather than not realizing that there wasn't anything I didn't know. Um, so probably around, yeah, probably sort of 2011, 2010, 2011, I began to sort of start thinking, okay, right, there's there's more, I needed my skill set now, um, and started then probably that shift into that kind of next phase of of my sort of sort of professional life, more on the marketing side than on the BD side. And and did you quite quickly realize that professional services seem to have a problem? with advertising or is that something that you've recently concluded I know it's something that you talk on really well so it, it's it's interesting actually so my, my when I first joined DAC Beechcroft the the senior partner at the time I remember sort of talking to him and and him saying yeah don't whatever you do don't mention the word advertising to lawyers because they'll just think you're utterly insane because it's just not relevant. It's not how things are done. And yeah, we just don't talk about that. It's kind of almost like sort of, you know, Voldemort here, who shall not be named, you know, advertising is like the marketing channel that shall not be named. And it, yeah, it, he, he had a really interesting view, I think, of, of, of law firms and partnerships. And, you know, this whole thing of we have clients, not customers, because, you know, customers is just a bit what like high street B two C retailers do, whereas you know law firms are a bit more sophisticated. And yeah, he, he him talking a lot about you know almost that that history of the term client and the implications of patronage going back to you know the nineteenth century of you know lawyers would would they take on clients or not, and clients would have to you know pay for the privilege just of being looked after as opposed to actually sort of for the work so I think I'd always sort of known from quite early on that yeah there are things that you just don't do and I think you know it it has changed I think undoubtedly well as as we know from the you know the Langleasy advertising campaign we ran but yeah certainly in the you know the early noughties it was um, yeah it would have been probably verging on career suicide to suggest running an advertising campaign for a law firm it's fascinating isn't it and as someone who um obviously has very limited uh, by comparison experience in in this industry how 
when I think most people, Joe blogs on the street, thinks of lawyers or even even just pictures the offices that lawyers will likely reside in, particularly, you know, the, the top, top lawyers, you think of big, grandiose buildings like you do with banks. And obviously, nowadays, the likes, the likes of Richard Shotton and Rory would 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 talk about signaling and that extreme kind of significant signals that are, that, that are received from people, which is very much like the signals you get from big mass media. So it seems strange that I'm sure historically lawyers did benefit from something that you could very closely link to advertising. Maybe the word itself just has that kind of reputation. So I wonder, is it is it just it wasn't done? or it shouldn't have been done. I'm always sort of slightly loath to admit that this is true, but I think it probably it probably is. You know, and again, we're, you know, we're talking almost sort of 15 years ago when I joined DAC Beechcroft. Marketing in professional services firms, particularly law firms, is still actually a relatively new thing. You know, you, that, and again, that you know, going back to, you know, partnerships being set up where you had, yeah, pretty much the only people that worked in a partnership were the the lawyers, you know, maybe with some secretaries. That was it. So you had a, you know, and, and you still have it in some law firms that have a partner responsible for HR or a partner responsible for, for finance. They won't actually do that. They'll have a HR director and a finance director, but there's still almost that sort of point person within the partnership that has responsibility for making sure that function does what it needs to do. So I think there's there's an element that you know it's still relatively new, and you know it wasn't you know for for a long time you actually were prohibited from marketing your services as as law firms. So I think you've got that element of just the 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 youthfulness of. Of the of of marketing in in professional services, I think then you know and you think about how much the resistance to how brands grow when it first came out, even from amongst the marketing community, and how much that really challenged that conventional wisdom. So you still, I think, had that lack of understanding of of what advertising does and and how it works and how it can benefit you. And then you also add in that I said that slight element of of snobbishness that it's you know it's not seen as something that lawyers should be doing or professional services firms should be doing. Um, and I still have you know conversations with lots of people and outside of Langley, so I'm not just talking about in in Langley's, you know, where it will still be the well that may be how the B two C world works, but that's not how B two B works, and it's definitely not how professional services works. So I think all of you know all of those things combine um, to a point where it's just not even considered as something that would be appropriate. And I think this it's it's an interesting thing, you know, now where you you can you kind of make the argument for almost in, in overly simplistic terms, or the fact that nobody else is doing it, or very very few people are doing it means it's absolutely the right thing to do because the cut through that you'll get is absolutely huge but you're fighting against you know decades of of perceived conventional wisdom about what is or isn't appropriate so it's that that endless frustration of the opportunity is so great but the resistance is so great as well yes that's a really good way of putting it really good way well well in fact um i planned to talk about this earlier but it seems like a really appropriate time to bring up a recent piece that you published yourself called On Bananas or Why Professional Services Isn't As Different As You Think. And um, there's a nod there to past guest Wima Schneider, the Dutch banana man, everyone's banana man friend. And and using your own primary research as well as anecdotal research and references to the likes of uh, Byron Sharp and the work that comes out of Ehrenberg Bass and, and, and Field and Burnett, you, you've demonstrated that the very same rules do apply. Yeah, so it's interesting actually. This was something that I, I mean, started looking at years ago. So before taking the, the the job with Langley's, I'd spent you know five five six years or so working as thirteen, sort of a consultancy virtual agency. Depends how grand I want to make it seem. How 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 I might describe it, um, but consulting to professional services firms. Um, and yeah, it was after sort of after reading How Brands Grow 
which I'm always amazed at. It was it was 2010, wasn't it? I think it was first published, but it wasn't until much later that I heard about it. I don't know if I was just completely, I was going to say completely behind the curve, no pun intended in terms of negative binomial distributions or, or whatever it's called. And yeah, kind of had that thing of, okay, does this hold true in in law firms and other professional services firms? So some of the some of the firms that I was, you know, working with kind of were were up for up for looking at it. Um and then I say moved back in house with Langley's and slightly kind of lay lay dormant for a while. And yeah, I'm not sure what it was that prompted me to kind of look at it again, but yeah, to try and say, okay, right, we 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 have these patterns, you know, particularly the double jeopardy law and natural monopoly law. And actually, if we look at the distribution of a law firm's clients, does it look exactly the same? And it looks pretty much exactly the same. Um, you know, we just from from Langley's, you know, we know that, you know, getting on about half of our clients, you know, when we look over the course of a, you know, the period that I was looking at it over 12 months, you know, half of our clients instructed us twice or less. That's a third of our clients, of our biggest you know, clients didn't actually instruct us at all. It was work that was carrying on from the previous year. So that sort of importance of light buyers, people actually only instructing you infrequently, you know, once a year, once every two years, twice a year, whatever it might be, just pretty much applies, you know, as, as you know, hand in glove, pretty much sort of looking, looking across it, which I, again is, but I think back to, you know, I was talking, we were talking earlier about the key client management at DAC Beechcroft. That was what we got wrong, that yeah, we had, we did have clients that, you know, and, and in the insurance world, they were instructing us, you know, probably hundreds of times a year in terms of, um, uh, you know, independent insurance claim, insurance claims and so forth. But still across the, the entirety of our client base, they were the absolute tiny minority. So yeah, it's it's been interesting, kind of getting people's sort of reaction to to the piece from inside the professional services world, because there yet yeah, there are still people that you know read it and say, "Yep, this just proves the importance of key account management and focusing on people that buy from you really often and growing those relationships." Because I think it is it is a little bit um, it is a little bit challenging because again, it just goes against conventional wisdom and the other thing as well is it's a bit geeky and i think this is probably why why i quite like it because i'm a bit of a geek looking at yeah oh what does this what does this chart look like and if i've got this excel spreadsheet and you know turn it into a bar graph how does that look and is it the same or is it not i love all of that stuff and I, i'd imagine for lots of lots of people lots of marketers their eyes sort of slightly glaze over and trying to kind of explain to people well this is why it's really important and this is what the implications are and I find myself getting more and more excited and more and more passionate and probably even more rambly than normal and then everyone looking at me is like oh god he's gone off on one again what's he what's he on about let's just keep quiet and he'll eventually run out of steam and stop talking yeah but it is interesting especially when you visualize things I remember watching Wiemer Schneiders deliver a keynote at uh, DMX Dublin, which the run by run by the brilliant Colin Lewis. In his slide deck, I'm going to lose the uh, the specifics because I can't quite remember. But he was basically doing exactly what you just said. If I get this piece of data and turn it into a bar chart, what does that look like? If I put it in a this type of scattergram, what does that look like? And it was exactly demonstrating how the way you present information and describe information visually can help you make those connections and associations etc now I, I know that there's a danger that you can do it and you know there's almost that bias that as soon as you find something that you think correlates you then you know you think it does when actually it probably doesn't so there's always a an argument for you know rigorous testing and questioning and so on and so forth but it's it's both encouraging and interesting just to see that the negative binomial distribution aka the banana still exists does it has that been how do people respond to that i know it's only been published a, a week or so 
But how have people responded to that in professional services? They think you're making it all up. I don't think they think I'm making it all up. I think they, I'm going to sort of rewind just a little bit. I think one of the, one of the issues, and I, I suspect this isn't, uh, exclusive to professional services firms, I suspect it's in a lot of a lot of different industries, but it's probably more acute in professional services. I think they often struggle to see the link between marketing and revenue and profit. I think that there is that thing of hang on a second, you know, well, marketing that's about communication stuff, or it's about you know, well, producing marketing brochures and putting on events. Actually, it doesn't have anything to do with actually winning new work or growing revenues or increasing profit. So I think when someone from marketing starts talking about some of this stuff, I think often there's an initial reaction of, what on earth are you talking about? That's not what marketing is. That's what the finance function should be talking about. So I think in in some ways, you've got that bit of a bit of a battle. I think often, and this is where I think, I think it's, it's, I'm always wary of, of playing up differences between professional services firms and, and you know, normal commercial businesses. I use the word normal loosely there for any, any lawyers or, or accountants listening. But because you're talking, to, you're talking about this to someone who's also an employment lawyer or who's an actuary because they're your sales force and they're on the board you're talking to people who in a way have no interest in it it's kind of like well that's really really interesting but actually I've got a client who's about to go through a major reorganization so I've got to go and do all of the employment advice whatever that is involved in a major reorganization so I think you've there are lots of those kind of lots of those challenges and I think interestingly this is where that that thing of yeah making friends with the finance function becomes important because they're probably the people that will really get this and um, suddenly in a in a law firm or in a professional services firm and you know talking to other marketers about it yeah the majority of them aren't really interested because it's i think in a way not what they see as as what marketing should be doing either um and i think particularly within there's, I always think there's the phrase, wasn't it? You know, people get the governments they deserve. I'm not sure if I've made that phrase up or if it's real or whoever said it or people get the leaders they deserve. I think often in, in professional services firms, professional services, professional services firms get the marketing function they deserve in as much as they have an expectation of what they want marketers and their marketing and BD team or whatever they call it to deliver. And so the marketing and BD team just deliver what those partners want. And you sort of you get this ultimately I would I would argue quite damaging situation of actually, you know, what's the expectation of me? This is the stuff that people expect me to do, and therefore that's what I'll do. I've completely lost the thread of where I was going with that. But that's a sort of long way round of of saying, yeah, I think even to a lot of marketers. They're just not really interested in it. They might find it, you know, oh, that's quite an intriguing bit. I'll have a read of that. That's got some nice, nice charts in it. But when it comes to the actual, well, what what have I got to do in my day job? Actually, I've got all this other stuff to do. And, and this NBD, natural monopoly law stuff, doesn't really feature. So it kind of gets put in the, oh, that was a nice thing. And then forgotten. Time, weather, and We interrupt this podcast to announce that we will never interrupt this podcast with ads. Ads that awkwardly nudge you to contact the pod's host, Giles Edwards, on 01189 952 007. Only recently, some pod listening companies did just that, calling for guidance on direct mail and customer research. But we're not asking you to do that. Nope. Anyway, back to the show. Yeah, it is now. Hang on. Hold on. Yeah, I, 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 I take that point. And I think there's probably like almost a, a legacy issue that marketing departments have within all sorts of businesses where they are obviously just 
seen as the comms team and and, and actually I, I think I think in terms of the actual findings and conclusions you've made though and it's hard to say this without it sounding so obvious but it isn't just about what you should do and how you should respond it's how you it's what you shouldn't do so mm, I'm yeah, sure absolutely. there are like, like, even just say the expectations that you can automatically make clients uh, bill clients more for more work get them you know upsell and, and all sorts when, when actually the behavior of the, the the data suggests that that's you know unrealistic to expect from the large majority of your customers so in that instance from a bd perspective it does become a bit more of a focus yeah absolutely and i, I think i'm kind of conscious that i may have come across having a real downer on on in-house marketers and that's not sort of what my intention at all. I think what actually one of the the things I think is a real challenge, and partly why I stepped out of being an in-house marketer to sort of start thirteen. In an in-house marketing role, there is so much that you have, so many things that you need to do, and so much of that stuff is is business as usual stuff that you can't not do because it's business as usual. Um, so actually, your your time to the time available to to really well, kind of just to think in a way, but to focus on okay, right, what's what can we actually filter out and do less of? What do we need to do more of? It's quite it's quite difficult and quite challenging. So I'm always actually, believe it or not, really sympathetic to in house marketers with all of the different demands that they have on their time from quite a range of different other internal stakeholders. And I think this is this is particularly acute in in partnerships where, you know, we've got 30 odd partners in in Langley's and all of them will want something different and need something. So you're 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 constantly, you know, on that sort of delivery hamster wheel. So for me, part of the reason of of stepping out of being an in-house marketing director was to kind of say, okay, there are bits about the role that I really enjoy there are bits that you know i can kind of take it or leave it but i have to do because it's business as usual is there a way of doing just the stuff that i enjoy doing and actually can i have more time for my own learning and development can i have more time to sit and read how brands grow and think about what the implications are and that's that's easier to do when you're working for yourself and you're consulting it's not so easy to do when you are an in-house marketer. Um, so I, I think there's, there's that element as well of, you know, lots of in-house marketers saying, yep, yeah, this all looks really interesting, but I've got my to-do list is already too long. There already aren't enough hours in the day. And, I, you know, that's a, that is a real, a real challenge. And I, I think, you know, finding that, you know, even, you know, things like, you know, doing the, you know, your, your, your annual market research ahead of your, business planning and, and budget setting all of that stuff takes time out of almost sort of what people perceive as the day job you know and I think there's, there's a there's a, a challenge there for the industry to look at you know what is the day job and how do we focus more of that day job on prioritizing the things that will really have really have an impact yeah and there's all sorts of practicalities aren't there which you've just touched on which which can easily get in the way and as I said, I'm a I'm a geek, so I'm very happy to look at all of this stuff. Yeah. The main takeaway <laughs> well, is marketing go. needs more geeks. <laughs> well, then, if speaking of geeks, then uh, how have you applied the geeky principles, laws, um, and, and research from Ehrenberg Bass? So, if we focus on, say, help brands grow, how have you specifically applied your learnings from that in your own line of work? For me, it ties in a lot with the marketing week. MBA, I think, and almost sort of like going right back to the start where you know, you're talking about that kind of that diagnosis strategy tactics piece of, you know, what what's the, you know, in, in terms of the research, what's the size of the market that, that's, you know, whatever, how you want to call it, total addressable market, if that's the, the right phrase. And to an extent, realizing, you know, I think with the the research actually that we just had back on, you know, the, the personal legal services market across, you know, what, what Langley's re- would refer to as its core region. So North Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, East Yorkshire, you know, okay. So there's, you know, 1.1 million people there. 
okay, right, and we know that you know about thirteen percent of those people each year will need legal advice. So, in my head, I'm kind of instantly thinking at a practical level. Okay, so we've got our long and short of it there. We've got the the overall size of the market where we need to generate new demand and build that awareness and build that salience and potential future pipeline. And we need to do that across 1.1 million people because we don't know which 13% of that population will be the people that need, you know, to get divorced this year or do some inheritance tax planning or whatever it might be. So, you know, that importance of, of reach and as you know, as as Byron Sharp would say in How Brands Grow, you know, they are all potential buyers of Langley services. It gives us that that sort of starting point. And then, you know, from a, you know, a a Mark Ritson, okay, right, if we segment that market in in whatever the right way is in terms of the appropriate demographics or behaviours or or psychographics, um, okay, which of those particular segment do we really want to target this year in that sort of shorter term capturing existing demand type way and from that it's starting to build up the budget to kind of say okay right this is if we want to reach you know that 1.1 million people with the right sorts of communications in the way that will build that memory structures through the right sort of media multi-channel etc etc this is what we think it will cost and this is what we think the return might be and then right what's if you know if we're targeting that this particular segment again if we understand broadly what the what the purchase funnel is is like and, and where different people are at the, that stage we know okay right this is the campaign we need to build and if we increase metric x by whatever percent this is what we think the new revenue might be so and kind of almost just working in that very kind of quite logical, practical, unemotive, dispassionate kind of way to sort of, you know, through, you know, sort of through that rationale to kind of say, right, this is, you know, what our marketing plan is going to look like this year. And, you know, one of the challenges for for Langley's is, you know, there's, well, there's personal legal services, there's business legal services, there's residential conveyancing and how do we get that mix right within a context of, you know, we've got finite resources uh, in terms of people and money and time. And yeah, we, we, I think we know what some of those principles are. And actually, we, you know, we want to get the balance of long and short. How do we allocate budget? How do we make sure we're reaching all buyers to hopefully come up with, let's say, a good marketing plan for the year that will, that will help grow the business? Um, I think the other thing that's, that's really interesting, actually, well, interesting to me, so I'll I'll, I'll carry on with it. <laughs> Caveat <laughs> is, and I, th- I think this is something that's that's in you know how brands grow. I think it's something that that Mark Ritson talks about a lot as well of you know thinking about competitors versus alternatives, and I think one of the things that was surprising to me actually was was looking at you know, at a basic level, how many other law firms there are just in within Langley's core regions. Obviously, it's not now because I know the marketplace, but certainly joining, you know, um, you know, in, in the in the research that we did, you know, we've got, you know, 23 other law firms, you know, and, and you look at, okay, there's, you know, 1.1 million people, 13% of them need legal advice each year and you've got at least 23 law firms competing for that work you realize how ferociously competitive it is but also again going back to that earlier point of if you know no other firms are doing it it's probably worth doing because you'll stand out you know if you're if you're waiting until you know those that that 13 percent start searching online or asking for recommendations or, or doing whatever it is that they do when they when they need to find a law firm you're already kind of behind the curve and actually if you've built some of that salience and you know again as, as how brands grow would 
would encourage you to think about category en entry points. So at the point that they realize, oh, and I've got this problem X, and I think I need some legal advice. If you've already got, you're the firm that they think of, suddenly you're, you know, you're ahead of those 20 odd other law firms. So I think for, you know, for, for all of those reasons that, that, you know, applying some of those principles gives you a bit of a head start, I think, in terms of, of standing out versus, versus the competition. I'm mindful of crossing over into one of the listener questions. So I might move there now if that's that's okay with you. Absolutely, Luke. yeah, go ahead. So, as you know, asking the general public for their opinion, be it on Brexit or boat names, is notoriously fraught with danger, but that's not stopped us asking. So, I'm going to start with question two, because it links to what you've just been talking about. So, uh, this is from Elliot, and Elliot says, as a fellow recent mini-MBA alumni, do you have any tips for adopting a two-speed strategy? Yes, I do. I think the first bit is to is that understanding the size of the market, and obviously just talked about you know that link of you know what's the what's the total size of the market, and how many people are are, are buying each year, if that's the, the time frame that you're looking at. So I think unless you know that, it's very difficult to know. I say how many people you need to reach what's the what's the size of the potential opportunity each year you know we were looking at residential conveyancing and, and you know one particular segment that i suspect would be where we would want to to target you know the potential value of that is 37 million pounds a year which is you know a, astonishing and then you can look at okay well what's the you know that's just one particular one particular segment so i think until you know that the size of the kind of the total market and the size of the in-market population, it's difficult to understand what the what the balance is. And obviously there's the there's the 60 60 40 split 50 50 in, in B2B and you know that's been slightly sort of challenged in in recent times as can you have an arbitrary um balance. But I think if you if you do know those market sizes and you understand you know your levels of awareness and, and consideration and so forth. That should start to inform. Okay, right. How do we get that get that right balance? What do we need to spend in each? I think the other thing that I would say as well, because obviously the other challenge is then convincing your board or your FD to spend money on something that may not have a return in the immediate financial year. And I think that's where I say the the how brands grow stuff comes in. And looking then at your own client data as well to be able to present this is what the curve looks like in our own business it sort of starts to build that internal case and i think as well again just from a as kind of a buy-in perspective as many of those kind of case studies and examples that are out there you know from the likes of adidas and airbnb and john lewis all of these these businesses that have started shifting money from the the short term cap, just capturing existing demand into the longer term generating new demand i think is really useful to to build that business case so yeah i think there's the there's the the researching the market is that fundamental starting point understanding your own client base and the kind of the case studies and the examples probably the three things that i would that i would focus on great tips our other question is from chloe uh, based in leeds fine city a fine city if I, yeah indeed indeed she says how do you get buy-in from an often conservative by nature partners in professional services so i'm gonna i'm gonna caveat this with this is the thoughts of a 42 year old man who's been around the block and got the got the the scars to um to kind of to prove it which obviously is is a, f a fairly fortunate position to be in i think the one of the things that i always talk about in particularly in in law firms and i think this goes for any professional services business um and even more widely than that actually there you know within again i remember the, one of my old senior partners saying 
the thing to remember about lawyers is they never start anything from a blank sheet of paper. They've always got precedent or case law or what they did in the, with the last example that they kind of build from. And I always kind of make the point, marketing is exactly the same. We've got research and we've got empirical evidence and we've got laws of growth and trying to position marketing as being as serious and heavyweight and scientific, I use that word loosely, scientific um, profession as the profession of the business that you're in. Um, and I know, it's, again, it's something that I think Byron Sharp always says, doesn't it, about, you know, engineers, you know, follow the laws of gravity, but there are still loads of different ways of building a plane. So even if you're in, in an engineering business, okay, yeah, you've got laws and rules that you work to, but marketing is exactly the same. And I think tr that sort of positioning is quite important and really using the evidence, I think is really important as well. The other thing, and obviously this is only relevant if you're starting a new role, start banging the drum as early as possible. And again, so from, from the, the moment that I joined Langley's, I was boring people with how brands grow and the long and the short of it and, and all of those other bits and pieces. I think using that evidence right from the get-go, positioning marketing as being, yeah, this is your profession, Mr. or Mrs chemist or actuary or whatever it is marketing's my profession and i know there's a debate is it a profession or a trade so i'm going to use the term profession loosely um positioning it exactly like that and again if you if you're working with people who are innately skeptical and cautious and conservative being able to show them a a theory or a law or the evidence or a chart or a graph or an Excel spreadsheet actually can be really, really helpful because even if they don't kind of get what you're talking about, at least they might think, oh, there is evidence and thought behind this. You know, Lee hasn't just made this up that, oh, this is what we should spend our money on this year. They've gone through some rigor and, and some research and diagnosis. Therefore, I'll implicitly trust that he knows what he's talking about. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. And 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 it's not subjective, I suppose, as well. It's not just Lee deciding this is what we need to do. I, I liked what you said about lawyers never starting with a blank piece of paper. The other thing I've heard someone say, which actually I've really enjoyed noticing, especially when you watch those over-dramatized kind of Hollywood films set in courtrooms, that lawyers especially in cross-examination lawyers never ask questions that they don't know the answer to already <laughs> <laughs> yes um, and you can see it flow you can see it flow in films and all sorts i mean i'm sure in real life too uh, what i really enjoy about just thinking about that is that you can and maybe maybe it's just stealing your point and rephrasing it to be honest Lee. May, it, it, i like the fact that in, it, with marketing you can do that because of the evidence that exists you can kind of say well if it says this what should we do and well if we know this is true what does that mean we should be doing and, and i think there is a way of kind of almost having the conversation in the language of whoever you're trying to sell into whether it's a cfo or a partner of a law firm is is vital absolutely absolutely i think i, I do kind of take the mickey a little bit out of out of lawyers sometimes and I, but I do I do love them I think it is it is a fascinating industry to work in I think actually any partnership organization just trying to understand the psychology of of a partnership versus a corporate structure is is really really interesting but I think you know at the, the very start of Mad Men I'm guessing the majority of people who listen to Call to Action will have will have it's probably a, a safe assumption, yeah. At the very, very start where they talk about, you know, it was it was advertising sex on Madison Avenue who themselves came up with the phrase Mad Men. I think the law is one of those equally sort of self-mythologizing industries. I mean, what, let's say when I first joined DAT Beechcroft, someone said to me, you know, the best thing about working with lawyers is they're, you know, intelligent, driven and successful. And the worst thing about working with lawyers is they're intelligent, driven and successful and kind of chuckling to themselves and patting themselves on the back while they while they say it. 
and obviously it's it's complete nonsense. It's a nice little kind of sound bite, but and it's it's true for some people and not true for for other people. And you know, marketers occasionally give partners in professional services firms a hard time, but I do think it is that you know treating treating them with with res- with the with the respect in the right way, which is I'm not going to either patronize you that you're you know everything about everything and therefore I'm completely worthless but I'm also not going to patronize you that you're a complete idiot who thinks marketing is just about coloring in I'm going to treat you with the respect that you deserve and explain I say the the background to what we're doing and you know the research and the evidence because I think you're a smart capable intelligent person who'll get it and and by and large the majority of people do do get it and I think that's a you know it's a difficult sort of thing to get the balance right and again it's, that's why I kind of say it's slightly easy for me as as a 42 year old marketing director who's worked in professional service firms for 20 odd years but I think kind of starting off with that mindset is 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 really helpful in, in any sort of conservative small c conservative sort of organization yeah no it makes complete sense and it's good to have, you know, without the scars, you wouldn't have learned that. No, exactly, exactly. And I think, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I think there, there are probably very few mistakes that marketers in professional services firm make that I haven't made at least three times. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That's a great answer, Phil, for Chloe. Uh, the, fi- the final part of our interview then, Lee, is the four pertinent poses that we put to all of our guests Number one, what advice would you give to your younger self? I think I would I'd probably tell myself to commit more in the set it kind of I, what I, what do I mean by that? I mean I think if I look back, there are loads of things that I started and did and never fully committed to and then gave up. And that, in retrospect, I wish I had kind of committed to and stuck with. And I think, and I think part of that comes from a slightly sort of crippling fear of failure. So I always took the view of, well, if I give up with this, then I can't admit that I was actually rubbish at it. And I think to say, actually, no, kind of go all in on the things that you that you do, I think would be, would have stood me in good stead, I think. Go all in. It's good advice. If you could banish one thing from the industry, what would it be and why? And don't say agencies, although you're... (laughs) (laughs) Um, This is a toss-up, actually, between two. and I'm I'm on the fence. But I think I, I would ban the sort of narrow industry specific recruitment that we we have in in marketing um you know there there are so many you know marketing roles where oh we only want people that have already worked in the same industry or you know this person must have prior experience in a hyper growth SaaS scale up business and i and i think that I think that just contributes to a, a real dilution of ideas and kind of new approaches. And and it's kind of, in a way, that, you know, that, well, it goes to that market orientation point, doesn't it, of, of you know, we are not the client, I'm going to be an absolute vacuum and learn. Actually, recruiting people from out, marketers from outside of the industry that you're already in should be one of the greatest strengths that marketers have that willingness to go in and ability to obsess things completely objectively and be channel agnostic and be the voice of the of the customer rather than kind of going native and, and assuming things have to be done a certain way because that's how they're how they've always been done. I'm conscious I'm getting a bit ranty so I'm going to stop but yeah the the, the industry <laughs> Kind of it only in the industry recruitment would be my would be my my banishment. 
Yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, that's not come up before, but it's a brilliant one, and I couldn't agree more. And I would suggest it's bigger than that. It's also it, it comes into play agency side too. But equally, when perhaps when clients are considering agencies, they they understandably to a point look for agencies with experience in that sector. But actually, if as we know, asking the dumb question often leads to a great answer and great results. The more conditioned you are within a particular sector or anything the less likely you are to ask those questions because of that crippling fear of failure that you referenced earlier. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it goes back to is the the thing that, that Roy Sutherland talks about. Is that, you know, it's better to fail, to fail conventionally than succeed unconventionally. And again, how do, how do you convince people that, you know, that, that yeah, just following convention is, is likely to just bring you conventional results and actually the, the the safer thing to do if that's the right word is to to be unconventional but um so yeah that's my that's my room 101 for for, for marketing fantastic can we ask without going into too much detail what what it was versus in the semi-final you said there were two you were wrestling with yeah, yeah. uh it was the done is better than perfect mantra that seems to crop up in more and more places which I was, yeah, and again, this is the, the inner geek in me. I was, I was thought, I was like, okay, yeah, I, you see this, people saying this, but where does it actually come from? And I think it originated, actually, it was um, from Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook. And I'm guessing it was something that was adopted by the tech community with this whole sort of, you know, fail fast, move fast and break things. And I just think it's, it's kind of shorthand for lazy work um, and realising actually, yeah, things should be, you know, you should aim for perfect rather than just getting something out and done because therefore it's done. But there's definitely a tech related quote of, you know, ship it now and something will ship it. I'm sure that I've, that I've heard. Although saying that just to show my hand, I am a fan of, well, not only Sopranos, but don't get me started of, um, and I think it's attributed to something that was scripted to Tony Soprano, albeit it's obviously from a real person originally of more is lost through indecision than wrong decision or incorrect decision. And I do, I do think that that does play out sometimes. So that might clash and might make, make you think I'm, I'm a moron, but I, I, I think there is, there is, there is something there. No, because I, I think the, the other, the other point that you make is a, is a, is a good one that you've got the source for the quote. Because I think so often we end up chucking around quotes without realizing where they came from, where we first heard them and, and what the context is. And yeah, I would I would bet good money that the vast majority of the people going out there and quoting "Done's better than perfect" don't necessarily know where it's come from. So that's the inner pedant, inner pedant in me. So yeah, it's the, it's the power of a soundbite, isn't it? Or the power of you know, it's it's they're powerful things. And sadly, it's 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 too easy to share those, and these these things become truth very quickly even when they're not uh, we've got two more then so number three is that are there any books that you could recommend to our listeners now these these can be work related they can be entirely you know fictional whatever whatever floats yes so i've just finished reading actually the that will never work so it's mark randolph the sort of co-founder and first ceo of netflix has written a almost sort of business memoir of how Netflix started and then up to the point that, that after it kind of he left effectively, which actually was relatively early on. And I think there's, there's a few, I'm, I'm conscious, obviously, it's a, it's a focus on a startup, which kind of has its own uh, sort of nuance to it. But I think so much of what he talks about is, is just really insightful and representative of just really good you know marketing from kind of almost the business and economics of it so looking at distribution costs and supply chains and research and is this a viable idea what's the market need for it there's just so much in there that i think marketers of of all you know shapes and sizes can can take away and also it's written in quite a dispassionate way it's not your kind of usual business self-help book of this is what made us amazing and this is what everyone needs to do. And if you do these five things, you can guarantee to be successful. And, you know, he talks a lot about things they got wrong, things that didn't work. Yeah, just, just, just really, really interesting. 
And again, it's that interesting thing of what I thought the story of Netflix was, wasn't 100% correct, actually, and, and particularly in terms of some of the leadership stuff. Yeah, there's, there's a, a, you know, he's, he's quite big on kind of the culture and value stuff and can get, is a little bit preachy around some of those things. But yeah, I think for a, I'd say quite a dispassionate nuts and bolts look inside getting a business off the ground and what it takes to run a, a successful, profitable business. It's great. And I think particularly timely with the, all of these sort of tech businesses we have that, you know, are, you know, huge revenues, but zero profit and are, and are purely there just to get bought by, you know, a, a P&G or, or whoever it is. I think there's some really interesting stuff in there actually about the, the economics and, and cash flow of, of generating profit that I think is really good, a really good sort of reminder to to our industry. Any others before we move on? So actually, I was listening to the, and I'm going, going to apologise in advance because I'm not entirely sure how you pronounce her surname, but uh, Zoe Scammon or Scammon, not sure. Uh, Scammon, as I understand Scammon. it, yeah, Zoe Scammon. I wasn't yeah. sure, so apologies, Zoe, if I if I got that wrong. She'll just call you Lee Grunnell. That's, that's fair enough. I must reinforce the acute accent over the E for my uh, my French flair. I think when, when she was on, she recommended sci-fi and sort of was talking about, you know, for, particularly for creatives, that, in, that idea of world building. And I think the on a, on a similar tip, the completely, you know, divorce for anything to do with marketing, the Wolf Hall trilogy, Wolf Hall, bring up the bodies and the mirror and the likes. I think it's, I say it's not sci-fi, but the the way that Hiro Mantel created that world and the power of the writing to completely kind of subsume you as a as a reader was just kind of breathtaking. And I think particularly the last the last couple of pages were you know, the, one of the best, I think the best endings to a book I've ever read. So, uh, so yeah, from sort of something completely, yeah, one businessy marketing focus one and something then purely for, purely for pleasure would be, uh, yeah, the Wolf Hall trilogy. Zoe also uh, donated a wonderful isolated talks video where she, where she explores sci-fi even further, but it, but it's all about exploring that what if question and, and, you know, it just allows your brain to explore. And, and funny enough, the late great Murray Calder said something similar, either on the pod or, or another time to me. And actually, it makes so much sense. Both, you know, incredibly smart, brilliant people. I can't, I can't let you say uh, Wolf Hall without mentioning that the TV, uh, the TV series features Mark Rylance in it as well. I'm a massive, massive Mark Rylance fan. So, um, so I, I would recommend that as well as the book, obviously. It was he, he was he was brilliant in it. Was I, I? I do really hope they they do another series of that to kind of cover the rest of the the rest of the books because I think it was particularly in that his stillness was just there was something really powerful about almost watching him do nothing, just the slightest change in, in his facial expression um was was yeah absolutely absolutely brilliant because i think we've i think we've talked on on twitter actually haven't we about the the how don't look up was utterly abysmal apart from mark rylance who was who was great in it yeah i i think he's consistently wonderful i've seen him on stage a couple of times fortunately and he it just i i can't i genuinely can't put into words how incredible he is. Plus, he delivered one of the most kindest fuck-offs I've ever had when I asked him to come <laughs> on Call to Action. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I bet it's that thing, isn't it? If you're going to be told to fuck off by anybody, Mark Rylance is, is going to be up there in the top of the list. So we always dedicate every episode to someone and we bestow or hospital pass that honour to our guest who has to give their reason why. So would you kindly dedicate this episode? Yes. Again, I was I was sort of slightly torn in this, but I, I came down on the on the side of the more on the the the, the career side of things. Um, and actually so I mentioned obviously EY, uh, the global tax sales director. So I'm actually going to dedicate this to him, uh, a chap called Steve Witcher. Who and sort of the, the reason for that is he yeah I think he took a bit of a chance on a very raw green 
kid with not a huge amount of relevant experience and for whatever reason decided to uh, to give me a job and I think that that really was a great kind of a, a fantastic grounding and experience for a relatively young young chap to have so so thank you Mr Witcher and uh, this is dedicated to you. Excellent this episode is very proudly dedicated to Steve Witcher fantastic right so links to everything we've discussed uh, including that will never work. Uh, Wolf Hall will be on this episode's listing. How else can our listeners get more Lee Grinnell? Uh, so I'm fairly active on Twitter. So I think I'm at Lee Grinnell, um, which is definitely Grinnell, not Grunnell, just for uh, the avoidance of any doubt. Uh, LinkedIn as well. Um, yeah, and most of the things that I write are on, are on Medium. So I think it's, what is it? It's medium.com at Lee Grinnell. I'm sure if you just stick my name into into Medium, it'll come up on there. I've got that here, in fact, medium.com forward slash at Lee Grinnell. But we'll link we'll link to those recent articles, especially the, the most recent one that we, we did a bit of a deeper dive into. Lee, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's been so enjoyable and, and, and a real pleasure. No, ple- pleasure's all mine. I hope we didn't uh, waffle too much. No, that was, that was great. Thank you, Giles. Not at all, not at all. And finally, thank you to everyone listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do share and review the pod. Keep questions and guest requests coming in. To get in touch, it's easy to find Gasp online. You can check out CTA Pod on Instagram or just email hello at calltoaction.co. Try and I try.